This video is to help you uh, through chapter 4.4 on climate change, our last section in the ecology chapter. And before we do this, I should say and warn you, I have the Giants and Cowboys game on in the background. So if you hear me hollering or screams of joy, it's probably because something terrible has happened to that moron. Anywho, here we go. In this video, we're going to be talking a lot about Earth's atmosphere, which is kind of a weird thing to talk about if you're a biologist, right? So why are we talking so much about the atmosphere? Well, one of the roles of the atmosphere is to make Earth livable. So without the atmosphere there to retain the heat during the nighttime and to help prevent fluctuations in temperature, the organisms that inhabit Earth, for the most part, could not survive. Okay, so the atmosphere helps to kind of keep us warm at night and helps prevent these wild fluctuations in temperature that you may see on other planets. So our temperature here on Earth kind of looks like something like this, you know, fluctuations between day and night. Whereas on other planets, you see these big, huge fluctuations. Okay, no atmosphere there to help kind of regulate those temperatures. Now, the atmosphere is what's responsible for what we call the greenhouse effect, okay? And greenhouses, or sorry, the greenhouse effect was actually named after, you guessed it, greenhouses. And greenhouses were a wonderful invention, okay, allowing us to keep the inside warm enough for plant growth um, even during very cold times of the year. We'll talk more about how that works, but for now, you just need to know the definition. It's a planet's ability to use its atmosphere, again, super important part there, to retain heat and to keep warm even when no sunlight is hitting the surface. So here's how the greenhouse effect works, okay? So the first step here, solar energy, okay, which is a form of short wave radiation, enters the atmosphere. If you don't know what shortwave radiation is, that's okay. I'm going to explain that more in a little bit. So that shortwave radiation enters Earth's atmosphere. The second thing that happens is that solar radiation is absorbed by all kinds of objects on Earth, rocks, water, animals, plants, whatever, and it's transformed into heat. So one of the things that we know about energy is that it cannot be created and it can't be destroyed, but it can be transformed into other types of energy. So once that shortwave solar radiation is absorbed by something on Earth, it gets re-emitted as heat. Now, those objects radiate that heat back out towards Earth's atmosphere. So it goes back out this way. Heat is a form of long wave radiation, okay? So solar energy, short wave, heat, long wave, more on that later. The thing is, is that those long waves aren't able to escape the gases in our atmosphere, okay? They get trapped, and therefore that heat becomes trapped in Earth's atmosphere. And we see that a lot uh, with cars. This is constantly in the news when the weather is warm. Um, dogs and young children uh, being left in cars and having all kinds of health problems and even death. And here's why. The shortwave solar radiation enters the car through the glass. It's absorbed by objects in the car, your seats, your steering wheel, okay? It is then re-emitted back out as heat, but that heat is no longer at a wavelength that can escape the glass. So it gets trapped in there. And that's why the inside of your car is able to become much warmer than the outside, okay? It all has to do with not being able to get out through that glass. So if you open the windows, you'll have a much easier time of that heat radiating back outward toward the car. Or if you block, okay, the all of the windows, less of that shortwave radiation will enter. But the way that your car becomes very hot is almost identical to the way that the earth retains heat and that has to do with again the greenhouse effect. The only difference being is that in a car the thing keeping that uh, long wave heat radiation in is the glass 
Where is in the Earth's situation, what's keeping in that long wave heat radiation is the gases in our atmosphere. So you've heard me make mention of these greenhouse gases, the, ga the gases in our atmosphere. Well, in our atmosphere, we have a mixture of gases. Air and our atmosphere are mixtures of gases. There are a lot of gases in there that we're not going to talk about because in this section, we're only talking about the ones that act as greenhouse gases. So in other words, help to retain that heat. Other gases in the atmosphere are super important, just not for this effect. Okay, so the important ones here are carbon dioxide or CO2, water vapor, methane, that's supposed to be CH4, sorry for that handwriting, and nitrous oxides. Okay, so those are all very important. We say, however, that the two most effective are carbon dioxide and water vapor. And there are some really good reasons for that. The effectiveness of a greenhouse gas depends on a couple of different things. So how much heat it's able to uh, retain depends on a couple of things. First of all is its ability to absorb that long wave radiation. Okay, there's a reason why some clothes are warmer than other clothes. They retain your body heat better and more effectively. Gases work the same way. Some gases, just because of their chemical properties, are able to absorb more of that long wave heat energy better than others. The other thing that plays an important role here is the concentration of that gas in the atmosphere. Okay, so how well it works and how much of it there is plays a role in how well or how effective that particular gas is in retaining that long wave heat radiation. So in terms of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide definitely gets all of the press, all of the news. Carbon dioxide is like the Lady Gaga of greenhouse gases, okay? Well, there's a good reason why in this case, okay? So it is by far the most effective greenhouse gas. It has chemical properties that make it a very good reflector. So number one, it reflects a lot of heat. And number two, it remains in the atmosphere for a very long time. See, carbon dioxide is a very stable compound. It just kind of gets there and it says, I'm not going anywhere and I'm not changing forms and I'm just here to stay. Okay, so remember we said what makes different gases have different impacts is their chemical properties, like how well they're able to reflect that heat and the concentration. Well, if something can remain in the atmosphere for a very long time, then that concentration is going to increase. And we saw that when we were looking at the general trends in the carbon dioxide data on the last section. Um, so this is why we need to be very careful um, in terms of increasing the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There are other gases that are better at retaining heat, but they don't stay in the atmosphere as long, so their levels retain, uh, remain relatively low. So again, okay, here's our carbon dioxide, a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So let's practice kind of how to illustrate this concept of the greenhouse effect. Uh, this was actually one of the exam questions on the 2016 standard level exam, which to me would mean that maybe it's not going to be an exam question for a little while. But of course, you know, if I say that, that means it's for sure going to be an exam question. It doesn't matter. It's a good idea to understand how this works anyways. So I'm going to start with a couple things. I'm going to start with the earth. And I'm going to start with the sun. Now I'm going to draw in, okay, Earth's atmosphere. It's a very technical drawing going on here. Okay, so we have the sun, we have the Earth, and we have the atmosphere. I'm only labeling atmosphere because that looks like some kind of odd donut. Okay, if yours looks better than mine, then maybe you don't need to label it. So I'm gonna label my energy in red here. 
It's okay if you're just using one color because I'm sure yours looks better than mine. Energy from the sun is a very short wave radiation. Okay, so solar energy is going to enter Earth's atmosphere as short wave radiation. I'm going to label that here, short wave solar energy. Okay, so we call it short wave, okay, because there is a short dif distance between wave peaks, okay, a high frequency, short waves. So then again, that short wave solar energy gets absorbed by objects on the Earth and then re-emitted, but this time as long wave energy. Okay, so this is long wave energy energy also known as heat so long wave heat energy I'm using energy and radiation here synonymously that's okay and it's okay because I said it's okay just kidding it's okay because it's legit okay anyways so short wave radiation comes in gets absorbed by Earth's objects it gets re-emitted as long wave heat energy and that long wave heat energy can't pass through the atmosphere, okay? Some of those greenhouse gases will reflect it, okay, and send it back to Earth, okay? So here we have a situation where we are reflecting and sending that heat back to Earth. So if you think about the purpose of a jacket, okay, a jacket is there to kind of retain your body heat and send it back towards your skin, the atmosphere does the same thing for the Earth, okay? It traps this long wave heat energy and sends it back to the Earth, keeping this area a relatively stable temperature. Without this, okay, we'd be in big trouble because over here, there's no solar radiation coming in, okay? Because it's, it's night over here because the sun is over here. So on this side of the earth here, that's not receiving sunlight, this radiated heat energy becomes very, very important. And I wanna reiterate that it is super important. A lot of times you hear things about, oh, greenhouse gases, oh, greenhouse effect, like it's some kind of STD. It's not, okay? The greenhouse effect is actually a very good thing. Without it, like I said, during the nighttime, those temperatures would drop so severely, uh, and you know, living things don't really deal well with crazy changes or fluctuations in temperature. Okay, so we would have a big problem on our hands. We absolutely need it to keep those temperatures relatively stable. Don't get tricked into thinking that it is always a negative thing. Okay, it is absolutely essential to life on Earth. Okay, so then why does the greenhouse effect get so much bad press? Well, you're very welcome. You can blame that on old people like me and like this guy who grew up hearing the term not climate change, but we heard things like global warming. Okay, so global warming was the first name that we had for the effects of increased greenhouse gases. So what was happening is that our climate was becoming warmer and warmer over time. So scientists coined this term global warming. But what in fact is happening, maybe we need to rename this, maybe your generation will be smarter than mine and really stick to this term climate change, okay? Because old people like me and this guy sometimes confuse climate with weather. So climate change, we're talking long term, okay, over large amounts of time. So it is a well-known scientifically accepted fact that over time, temperatures are gradually increasing. Are they increasing all the time though? No, sometimes they're lower, sometimes they're higher, okay? Sometimes they're kind of all over the place. This long-term gradual increase has to do with climate, okay? 
Some climate change deniers will point out, well, how did this snowball get here in June? How come it's so hot in December on this one day? Well, that's because they're referencing weather. Weather is a current condition, so very short term. That, as we just said, can fluctuate for all kinds of crazy reasons, okay? Climate is long term, okay? So don't get those confused. When we're talking about climate change, is it possible to have one day that's hotter than it's supposed to be or one day that's colder than it's supposed to be? Yeah, because that's weather, okay? Let's start referring to global warming as climate change and then maybe we'll have more people understand what's really going on. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why some people are skeptical in terms of accepting this notion of climate change. And I can understand some of those reasons. Let's take a look at one of them. So this is kind of a well-known graph over here where it's showing uh, time on the x-axis, okay, and temperature over here on the y. And so we can see, again, fluctuations, but it seems to me that we had a long period of stable temperatures, we had kind of a drop and then stayed stable, kind of another drop and stayed stable, and then holy crap, take a look at this, okay, a pretty severe increase. Okay, so many climate scientists say, um, hello, it was this, then it dropped stable, dropped stable, but now we're seeing this crazy exponential increase, and we've never seen that before, okay? Anytime that it's gone, you know, kind of up or down, it's been a little bit more gradual. This is bananas, okay? Now, the problem with this graph is that smart people will look at this graph and they're gonna look at the actual values on the x-axis. And they're gonna say, okay, I understand how people were taking temperature in the year 2000. Good job, temperature takers. I understand how people were taking the temperature in maybe the year 1500. Maybe they had some really cool rudimentary thermometers back then. What I'm not understanding is how they took the temperature in the year 1000 or 500. I don't know. I've seen a lot of movies from back in those time periods. Didn't really look like they had a lot of cool technology going on. So how on earth did they measure all of these temperatures? That's the problem with some skeptics in terms of data like this. So it then becomes your job as a well-informed, well-educated citizen uh, to tell these people how exactly we got that data and how we're able to uh, determine that it's trustworthy and reliable. So to get temperature data before recorded times, climatologists use what we call proxies. Okay, and proxies mm, are almost like a model, right? So they allow us to make measurements and then extrapolate data. And we do that in two different ways, okay? One of those ways is by using fossils. So in the fossil record, we can identify certain organisms that are very temperature sensitive. Maybe they're organisms that have a recent or um, a close relative today or we're able to study them in some other way and we know that they have very sensitive or small temperature range. If we can tell at what period in time they died out, then we can assume that the temperature changed okay, a certain number of degrees then. I understand that sounds maybe the way that I'm explaining that, like not so accurate, but trust me, these rock fossil science people know their stuff. The most recent and probably most technologically advanced and accurate way of doing this is by taking ice cores, okay? So if you're ever traveling in the Arctic and you see a bunch of people like this drilling in the ice, they're either A, looking for oil, or B, looking for bubbles in the ice. I'll give you a hint uh, as to which one is worth more money. Anywho, so those air bubbles are pretty cool. Um, they can use radioactive dating. I'm not going to explain that concept because it has to do with carbon and half-lives and other things that sound way too much like chemistry. Um, but if you find that interesting, you can go ahead and Google it. Um, anyways, it's a test to determine how old the ice is. So they drill down, 
they get an air bubble. They take a sample of ice around it and determine how old the ice is. And then they can measure the ratio of oxygen isotopes in that air bubble to estimate the temperature. So again, at the risk of sounding like a total chemistry nerd, here goes. Oxygen can form different isotopes, okay? So having different numbers of neutrons in their um, nucleus of their atom. Those, the ratio of those isotopes is very dependent on temperature. So we can use those ratios to determine the temperature, okay? So again, we drill down, we take an air bubble sample, we measure the ratio of isotopes, which tells us what the temperature has to be in order to get that isotope. And then we take a sample of ice from around that bubble, figure out how old it is. And that's how we can tell the temperature from a really gosh darn long time ago. And it's very scientifically reliable. Okay, so if we want to take a look at how the climate, and I'm just referencing the temperature factor of climate, it doesn't take into account precipitation, wind, etc. But just the temperature part of the climate over the last 100,000 years, we're going to have to take a look at this graph. And this graph is a little tricky, but I'm glad we're looking at this because your IB test makers love them some tricky graphs. Okay, so here I see years down here. These are years times 1,000, so this is, well, zero. This would be 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, lots of time ago, okay? And the tricky part about this graph is that it is moving backwards. So normally we see things progress through time this way, like really old, less old, less old current. This graph goes the other way. So here's our current data. Okay, and here's 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, so it's going this way. I want you to take a look at this and really figure out what this means. Here's 100,000 years ago. Okay, I see a lot of fluctuations, okay, but I'm seeing a general like dip, a little rise, a little dip, okay, so kind of going up and down a little bit, but then all of a sudden, right before the current period of time, an exponential very dramatic increase, okay? So that's what's going on in the last 100,000 years. Is that pattern unique? Mm, not necessarily so. We've seen it a couple of times uh, before, but I will tell you that some not very good things happened here, okay? Um, more on that later. Okay, well, here is another way we can kind of graph uh, this temperature over a long period of time. Again, this to me, it looks more normal. 300,000 years ago, 200,000 years, 100,000 years ago. So progressing in time through this way, reading left to right. Okay, and here we have two different line graphs. In the red, we have temperature and temperatures uh, over here and then graphed in red. Over here, we have carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million, and that is graphed in blue. So I want you to take a moment to reflect and write down how these two variables are related. Be careful, there's a difference between causation and correlation. So if you fast forward this video because you're tired of listening to me and you accidentally wrote down the word cause, in your answer for your notes, go back and erase it, okay? Think about using the correct vocabulary and just take a moment to reflect on how those two are correlated or related. Okay, so one of the things that you're gonna hear a lot about in biology is this concept of a feedback loop. And feedback loops involve things that can affect one another, where one thing may trigger a change in something else. And we have two types of feedback loops. We have positive and negative. It's especially important that you understand this uh, in regards to some physiological topics, but here we're gonna talk about it in terms of an ecological topic. So let's talk about a positive feedback loop. A positive feedback loop means that an increase in one causes a greater increase in another one, and that in turn 
causes a greater increase in the original factor that changed, okay? So if this isn't making sense to you, okay, let's think about a bank account. When you put money in the bank, it earns interest. The more money you have in there, the more interest you earn, okay? That the money that you earn on interest goes back into your bank account. So it's an example of a positive feedback loop. As your account balance grows, you earn more interest. That interest goes into your bank account, so your bank account balance grows. Okay, as that bank account balance grows, more interest is earned, okay? So this is what we call a positive feedback loop. And as you can see, there's no end here. One causes more of the other, more of this causes more of this, and it just keeps going and going and going, okay? There's no stopping it. A lot of our physiological feedback loops are negative feedback loops, okay? So what they do is they bring values back somewhere into the middle. Positive feedback loops are like runaway loops. They keep going and going, okay? Negative feedback loops bring values back to some kind of center value. Let's take into account your body temperature. Your body temperature is supposed to be around 98.6 degrees. It's not the same for everybody, but that's just a general norm. If your body temperature rises, then your body starts to sweat. So an increase in this causes an increase in this. But when your body sweats more, it causes your body temperature to drop. Okay, so that's what we call a negative feedback loop. This causes an increase in this, but whatever it causes an increase in then causes a decrease in the original factor. Okay, so it's bringing things back to some kind of central value. Okay, it's not a runaway feedback loop. So body temperature causes sweat, brings my body temperature back down. Okay, so a negative feedback loop. I want you to think about carbon dioxide levels. Okay, remember warmer temperatures cause an increase in decomposition. If you don't believe me, leave some food out of your refrigerator on the counter and see what happens. It's gross, okay? So decomposition is triggered by warmer temperatures. So let's think about that. Warmer temperatures are going to cause an increase in carbon dioxide. Why? Well, that's because when we say decomposition, we really mean that there's some little bacteria or other decomposer eating dead things and performing, I don't know why that's a bacteria, anyways, eating dead things and when they eat it, they're using the dead things for cellular respiration. So carbon dioxide, not carbon dioxide, glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide plus water plus a lot of other kinds of energy, okay? But when they're decomposing things, they are creating carbon dioxide. So when it's warmer out, we get more decomposition, which leads to more carbon dioxide. Okay, the more carbon dioxide there is, the warmer the temperatures. Why? Well, because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So the more carbon dioxide we add to the atmosphere, the warmer the temperature is. The warmer the temperature is, the more carbon dioxide we get because of this decomposition. Okay, so now's a good time to think about what kind of feedback loop this climate change is. Pause the video, think about it, write it down, and then continue. So when I was growing up, only really nerdy scientists um, or citizens were talking about global warming or climate change. The super hot topic back in the 90s was the concept of this hole in the ozone layer. And scientists did a really bad job of explaining this back then. Okay, they were like, oh, there's a hole in the ozone layer. If you start to tell people there is a hole in the earth, they get really freaked out, okay? So what was happening is uh, we have several different layers to our atmosphere. We were releasing some gases through some certain industrial and consumer processes that was depleting that one gas called ozone, okay? Like I said, there are many gases in the atmosphere. 
Ozone is one of them, along with carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, etc. Ozone forms its own layer in the atmosphere, and these naughty things we were doing were, was literally depleting that ozone and causing a hole in that ozone. Ozone uh, blocks or helps to block the UV rays from the sun. So if we were depleting it, okay, what was once blocking not heat but UV rays, okay, was no longer blocking it and they were getting to the earth, okay, and it was causing some pretty gnarly sunburns along with a whole bunch of other problems. Is that bad? Uh, yeah, we don't want a hole in the ozone layer. Does it have anything to do with the greenhouse effect? No. Ozone is not a greenhouse gas. It can reflect UV radiation, but not heat radiation. Okay, so ozone is not a greenhouse gas. It is something that we need to be mindful of, but it has nothing to do with global climate change or the greenhouse effect. Okay, so to understand really what's going on with our global perception of climate change, we need to get one thing straight. There is a debate about climate change, but it is not about carbon dioxide. We know that carbon dioxide results in increased global temperatures. Why? Because science. First of all, I have the data. Increased carbon dioxide levels, increased temperature. Also, we know carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Okay, physicists, no offense to our lovely physics teachers, are kind of like boring, unemotional, very hard science people. They will tell you, okay, without any kind of skin in the game, without any kind of bias, okay, the properties of carbon dioxide cause it to reflect that long wave heat energy, okay? So if we can prove scientifically that carbon dioxide and temperature are linked, then what the heck is the debate about? Well, the debate is what is causing the carbon dioxide level, okay? So even amongst uh, the most vehement uh, climate change deniers, okay, there's no debate that carbon dioxide level is caused or causes higher temperatures. What there is some debate about is whether or not those increased carbon dioxide levels are caused by human activities or if they're part of some kind of natural cycle. So in order to do that, we need to go back and take a look uh, in the wonderful vessel of our time machine. I've already shown you the graphs that have very long-term temperature data back hundreds of thousands of years. And I keep saying, oh my gosh, look at this crazy exponential spike. Well, here's that crazy exponential spike. Oddly enough, okay, again, we have global temperatures going up, we have global carbon dioxide levels going up, and all of that upward trend happened to coincide with what we call the Industrial Revolution, okay? So once we, as human beings, started to figure out that we could burn fossil fuels, okay, to harness that energy for uh, factories, steam engines, electrical usages, all kinds of things, okay, then we're really seeing a dramatic increase in carbon dioxide and in temperatures, okay? So the Industrial Revolution happened to be the dawn of the age where we were burning fossil fuels at an extremely rapid rate, I might add, okay? And it coincides with the rise in that carbon dioxide and the rise in global temperatures. If you look at our industrial activity, okay, in relationship to our carbon dioxide, they both increase. So let me give you my spin on this climate change carbon dioxide debate. We know carbon dioxide increases temperatures. And I will tell you that the scientific data overwhelmingly supports the idea that it is human activities that is causing that increase in carbon dioxide. Over the large spans of historical time, have carbon dioxide levels fluctuated? Of course they have. As species become extinct or as new species start to populate, we're going to see fluctuations in carbon dioxide levels, but not as dramatically 
as we've seen since the Industrial Revolution. And the only way of explaining that is the Industrial Revolution uh, caused greater it, human influences on carbon dioxide production. The number one being here, fossil fuel use. So we talked about that in section 4.3 on carbon cycling. Burning things, particularly coal, oil, and natural gas, releases that sequestered carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. A couple other human activities that cause uh, carbon dioxide release into the environment include the land use changes. And what does that mean? Well, I don't want you to write land use changes in your notes. What we mean by land use changes is that we're really deforesting land, okay? We're cutting down trees. And when we cut down trees, presumably we're burning them, so that's releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we're also removing organisms like plants that can, are able to absorb that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay, so land use changes. Also industrial processes. Okay, so things that might produce other greenhouse gases that we will then turn into carbon dioxide or plastics. Lots of things uh, that can fall into that category. Now, carbon dioxide isn't the only gas that we're seeing an increase with uh, in regards to human activity. Methane, another one of our important greenhouse gases, is also on the rise. Now, how can that be? Because humans uh, have relatively small bacterial colonies in their guts that produce methane in particular, okay? Do we produce methane in our farts? Yes. Is it as much methane as is in the farts of things like cows and other ruminants? No, not so much. So how are we blaming this on humans? Well, because we're eating more meat, okay? The more meat we're eating, the more cows and other animals that have to be on the earth to satisfy our meat needs and the more methane they're producing. Okay, so why are we eating more meat? Well, we like it and there are more countries on earth now that can afford it. So industrializing countries or developing countries may not be able to afford meat, but as we see more countries on the earth start to become economically viable and industrialized, we're seeing a rapid increase in their meat consumption. Again, more humans, more meat, more cows, more cow farts, more methane. Gross. Now, uh, us humans um, can handle a relatively uh, wide range of temperature fluctuations, okay? So we can live in environments where it's relatively hot, relatively cold, okay? We've managed um, to adapt to those different environments. There are other animals and other plants, fungi, etc., that are much more sensitive. And one of those animals is coral. Yes, coral looks like a plant, but it is in fact an animal, okay? And coral uh, those animals live, live in colonies called reefs. So co coral reefs in general are very sensitive to quite a few things. Okay, they're very sensitive in terms of water temperature. So increased levels of carbon dioxide are causing global temperatures to go up. And the guy, these guys are not happy about that. Also, that increased carbon dioxide level is increased increasing the pH of the water. So we learned about that in the last section too, okay? That in our lakes and oceans, okay, water can absorb carbon dioxide, but when it does, it forms an acid. So it causes the pH to drop. Well, the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, the more is going to be absorbed by this water and the more the pH is going to drop, the more acidic it's going to become. Okay, so water acidity is a huge problem. These coral reefs are very sensitive to the pH of their environment. Also, the depth of the water is a problem. So as we see increased temperatures, okay, more sea ice is melting, which could potentially and dramatically change the sea levels. Okay, coral reefs live in a very narrow range of depths. They need just the right amount 
um, of depth for a whole ton of different physiological processes that we're not going to go into. Okay, but that could be a very bad situation. So these are what our coral reefs should look like. These are what many of our coral reefs are beginning to look like. Okay, particularly due to these things right now and then potentially this later on. Okay, there are still some things you have not finished in your notes packet. I don't want you to worry about them. I'm going to do them with you in class. So everything from where it talks about uh, are humans causing climate change and response from critics and precautionary principle and the ecological footprint calculator, I don't want you to worry about that. Okay, you go have yourself a lovely rest of your evening unless you're doing this the morning that the notes are due in which shame on you and I will see you in class.